This is the Bible in one year, day 31. How to lead like Jesus. Few people have shaped the day-to-day -day management of people and companies more than Ken Blanchard, author of The One Minute Manager, which has sold more than 13 million copies. The book was so successful that he had trouble taking credit for its success. He began to think about God. He started to read the Bible. He went straight to the Gospels. He wanted to know what Jesus did. He became fascinated with how Jesus transformed 12 ordinary and unlikely people into the first generation of leaders of a movement that continues to affect the course of world history 2,000 years later. He became aware that everything he taught or written about effective leadership, Jesus had done to perfection, way beyond Ken's ability to portray or describe. Jesus is more than just a spiritual leader. He gives a practical and effective leadership model for all organizations, for all people, for all situations. You may not think of yourself as a leader, but leadership is about influence. You do have influence, therefore, in a sense, all of us are leaders. Jesus is the greatest leader of all time. In the passages for today, we see some of the characteristics of Jesus' leadership, together with those of two other great influencers in the Bible, David and Job. From Psalm 18. I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I called to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I have been saved from my enemies. The cords of death entangled me. The torrents of destruction overwhelmed me. The cords of the grave coiled around me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. My cry came before him into his ears. A leader's worship. David was one of the greatest leaders in the history of Israel. He also wrote some of the most beautiful songs of worship ever written. Thousands of years later, his psalms continue to be used in worship by God's people. In this psalm, we see that David's worship and prayer was the bedrock on which his leadership was founded. In the midst of difficulties and opposition, he says, I call to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. The result? was a great reversal in circumstances, followed by success, which led David to express his thanksgiving in song. Whether in difficulty or success, follow David's example by seeking to build your life on the foundation of prayer and worship. The starting point of worship is love for God. I love you fervently and devotedly, O Lord, my strength. David goes on to express his love, praise and thanksgiving to God, he faced enemies, death and destruction and distress. When he looks back, he can see how God heard his cry and saved him from his enemies. For the last few years, I have written down a list of cries for help in the margins of my Bible in one year. It's amazing to see the ways in which God has heard my cry. So many of the prayers, although not all quite yet, have been answered. Keeping a record helps me not to forget to thank God. O oh Lord, my strength, thank you so much for the many times when I've called to you for help and you've heard my voice. With all the challenges ahead, again, I cry to you for help. New Testament from Matthew 21 As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. 
they brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read? From the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth your praise. And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany, where he spent the night. A leader's characteristic. What does it mean in practice to lead like Jesus? First, lead from who you are more than your position. Who you are is far more important than what you do or what you have in terms of possession or position. Jesus' authority didn't come from having a high position in some hierarchy. It came from who he was as a person. He had a natural authority. He had total confidence that all he needed to say was, the Lord needs them. No threats or promises were required. Second, be gentle and unassuming. Your king comes to you gentle. This is not a characteristic of leadership that the world expects, yet it is right at the heart of Jesus' leadership. The Greek word for gentle means considerate, unassuming. It's the opposite of aggressive or self-seeking. Third, avoid arrogance and ostentation. Jesus entered Jerusalem on a donkey. What a contrast to so many other leaders in history, secular and religious, who've traveled with pomp and ceremony and ostentatious entourages. Jesus' mode of transport was a sign of great humility. It was the opposite of pride and arrogance, which can so easily creep into human leadership. Fourth, have the courage to confront. People sometimes think that gentleness and humility mean giving way in every situation. But Jesus was not afraid of confrontation. He entered the temple area and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers. One of the hardest aspects of leadership is to know the right moment for confrontation. Failure to confront is in itself a decision with consequences. Conflict and confrontation are never easy, but wisely applied, they are a necessary part of good and courageous leadership. Fifth, seek spiritual, not worldly power. The power of Jesus was so different from many of the leaders in the world. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. Spiritual power is far more important than earthly power. It cannot be manufactured. It can only come from the kind of relationship Jesus had with God. Sixth, make prayer your number one priority. In Jesus' confrontation with the money changers, we see how passionate he was about prayer. And throughout the Gospels, we read of Jesus withdrawing to be on his own with God. This was the source of his strength. Like with David, prayer was at the heart of Jesus' leadership. Lord, help me to lead like Jesus with authority, gentleness, humility, courage, and power. Like Jesus, may my strength come from my personal relationship with you. Old Testament from Job 19 to 21. Then Job replied, How long will you torment me and crush me with words? Times now you have reproached me. Shamelessly you attack me. If it is true that I have gone astray, my error remains my concern alone. 
If indeed you would exalt yourselves above me and use my humiliation against me, then know that God has wronged me and drawn his net around me. Though I cry violence, I get no response. Though I call for help, there is no justice. He has blocked my way so that I cannot pass. He has shrouded my paths in darkness. He has stripped me of my honor and removed the crown from my head. He tears me down on every side till I am gone. He uproots my hope like a tree. His anger burns against me. He counts me among his enemies. His troops advance in force. They build a siege ramp against me and encamp around my tent. He has alienated my family from me. My acquaintances are completely estranged from me. My relatives have gone away. My closest friends have forgotten me. My guests and my female servants count me a foreigner. They look upon me as a stranger. I summon my servant, but he does not answer, though I beg him with my own mouth. My breath is offensive to my wife. I'm loathsome to my own family. Even the little boys scorn me. When I appear, they ridicule me. All my intimate friends detest me. Those I love have turned against me. I am nothing but skin and bones. I have escaped only by the skin of my teeth. Have pity on me, my friends. Have pity, for the hand of God has struck me. Why do you pursue me as God does? Will you never get enough of my flesh? Oh, that my words were recorded, that they were written on a scroll, that they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead or engraved in rock forever. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. If you say, how we will hound him since the root of the trouble lies in him, you should fear the sword yourselves. For wrath will bring punishment by the sword, and then you will know that there is judgment. Job chapter 20. Then Zophar the Naamathite replied, My troubled thoughts prompt me to answer because I am greatly disturbed. I hear a rebuke that dishonors me, and my understanding inspires me to reply. Surely you know how it has been from old, ever since mankind was placed on the earth, that the mirth of the wicked is brief, the joy of the godless lasts but a moment. Though the pride of the godless person reaches to the heavens and his head touches the clouds, he will perish forever like his own dung. Those who have seen him will say, where is he? Like a dream, he flies away, no more to be found, banished like a vision of the night. The eye that saw him will not see him again. His place will look on him no more. His children must make amends to the poor. His own hands must give back his wealth. The youthful vigor that fills his bones will lie with him in the dust. Though evil is sweet in his mouth and he hides it under his tongue, though he cannot bear to let it go and lets it linger in his mouth, yet his food will turn sour in his stomach. It will become the venom of serpents within him. He will spit out the riches he swallowed. God will make his stomach vomit them up. He will suck the poison of serpents. The fangs of an adder will kill him. He will not enjoy the streams, the rivers flowing with honey and cream. What he toiled for, he must give back uneaten. He will not enjoy the profit from his trading. For he has oppressed the poor and left them destitute. He has seized houses he did not build. Surely he will have no respite from his craving. He cannot save himself by his treasure. Nothing is left for him to devour. His prosperity will not endure. In the midst of his plenty, distress will overtake him. The full force of misery will come upon him. When he has filled his belly, God will vent his burning anger against him and rain down his blows on him. Though he flees from an iron weapon, a bronze-tipped arrow pierces him. He pulls it out of his back, the gleaming point out of his liver. Terrors will come over him. Total darkness lies in wait for his treasures. 
A fire unfound will consume him and devour what is left in his tent. The heavens will expose his guilt. The earth will rise up against him. A flood will carry off his house, rushing waters on the day of God's wrath. Such is the fate God allots the wicked, the heritage appointed for them by God. Job chapter 21. Then Job replied, Listen carefully to my words. Let this be the consolation you give me. Bear with me while I speak, and after I have spoken, mock on. Is my complaint directed to a human being? Why should I not be impatient? Look at me, and be appalled. Clap your hand over your mouth. When I think about this, I'm terrified. Trembling seizes my body. Why do the wicked live on, growing old and increasing in power? They see their children established around them, their offspring before their eyes. Their homes are safe and free from fear. The rod of God is not on them. Their bulls never fail to breed. Their cows carve and do not miscarry. They send forth their children as a flock. Their little ones dance about. They sing to the music of tambourine and lyre. They make merry to the sound of the pipe. They spend their years in prosperity and go down to the grave in peace. Yet they say to God, Leave us alone. We have no desire to know your ways. Who is the Almighty that we should serve him? What would we gain by praying to him? But their prosperity is not in their own hands. So I stand aloof from the plans of the wicked. Yet how often is the lamp of the wicked snuffed out? How often does calamity come upon them, the fate God allots in his anger? How often are they like straw before the wind, like chaff swept away by a gale? It is said, God stores up the punishment of the wicked for their children. Let him repay the wicked, so that they themselves will experience it. Let their own eyes see their destruction. Let them drink the cup of the wrath of the Almighty. For what do they care about the families they leave behind when their allotted months come to an end? Can anyone teach knowledge to God, since he judges even the highest? One person dies in full vigor, completely secure, and at ease, well nourished in body, bones rich with marrow. Another dies in bitterness of soul, never having enjoyed anything good. Side by side, they lie in the dust, and worms cover them both. I know full well what you're thinking the schemes by which you would wrong me. You say, where now is the house of the great, the tents where the wicked lived? Have you never questioned those who travel? Have you paid no regard to their accounts? That the wicked are spared from the day of calamity, that they are delivered from the day of wrath? Who denounces their conduct to their face? Who repays them for what they have done? They are carried to the grave, and watch is kept over their tombs. The soil in the valley is sweet to them. Everyone follows after them, and a countless throng goes before them. So how can you console me with your nonsense? Nothing is left of your answers but falsehood. A leader's perspective. Job's friends continue talking nonsense and a tissue of lies. They attempt to comfort Job with empty and futile words. On the other hand, we see Job's real struggle with his own suffering. As opposed to the simplistic analysis of his friends, he sees that the world is very complex. In this life, there are many injustices. He cries out, why do the wicked live on, growing old and increasing in power? They spend their years in prosperity and go down to the grave in peace. Don't be surprised that sometimes there are those who completely reject God. They say to him, leave us alone. We have no desire to know your ways. Who is the Almighty that we should serve him? What should we gain by praying to him? Yet they appear to live lives of prosperity and peace. The Bible never says that the wicked will receive justice in this life. Sometimes they do, but at other times they seem to get away with it. Don't be surprised if you see the wicked spending their years in prosperity. Don't be surprised if you see the innocent suffering.
God seems to allow both in this life. That's not to say that we should ever be complacent about injustice and the suffering of the innocent, but rather do all in our part to combat both. However, this life is not the end. God has all eternity to put things right. Job glimpses, in a way almost unique in the Old Testament, our future hope. I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end, he will stand upon the earth, and after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh, I will see God. Job's insight foreshadows the New Testament hope of resurrection and eternal life. A godly leader has an eternal perspective which gives a totally different dimension to Christian leadership. Imagine someone important coming to visit your home. You would probably do a number of things to get ready. You'd get yourself ready. You'd ensure others in the house were ready. And you would ensure that the house itself was ready, looking clean and tidy. A Christian leader has an eternal perspective and hope that in the end, my Redeemer will stand upon the earth. Focus on getting yourself ready, getting others ready, evangelization, discipleship, pastoral care, and getting the house ready. The revitalization of the church and the transformation of society. These concerns are not just confined to church leaders. Christian leaders in all spheres of work and society should have these three underlying dimensions embedded in their thoughts, their decisions, and their actions. Furthermore, this perspective should transform your attitude towards your plans and goals. When situations do not work out as hoped, Due to the injustice of individuals or organizations or systems, you can still trust in the fact that one day, total justice will prevail. Lord, thank you that one day I will see God myself with my very own eyes. Help me to live each day with this eternal perspective. Help me to become like Jesus and to lead like Jesus. Pepper adds... The verse, Job 19.25, says, I know that my Redeemer lives. It appears in part of Handel's Messiah. This piece of music was sung at my father's funeral. It is so beautiful and deeply comforting. Handel set these powerful words to the most amazing music. Since 1742, when it was first performed, it's been giving comfort and faith to millions of people.